Besides historic preservation, her other areas of interest include the Underground Railroad, particularly in Delaware and in Prince George's County, genealogy and the development of African American communities. Her works have appeared in a number of journals and have been presented at several conferences. She's going to speak to us today about free communities of color in the district. Please join me in welcoming Patsy Fletch. our previous speakers because I'm at that age now where uh, certain things go. For some people it's private summers, uh, for some people it's uh, restless leg syndrome. I'm one of those that has a short-term memory loss, so I have to read my presentation. Um, when I started off, I wanted to share a story of the agency of free black communities in Washington, D.C., and the role of its inhabitants in emancipating their enslaved brothers and sisters. And there were a couple of reasons that I thought this story was important. First, we continue to be left thinking that the issue of abolition and emancipation is a white liberal endeavor even in spite of recent scholarship by Stanley Harold and Josephine Pacheco, indicating that the effort was at least one of interracial co cooperation. But the story, the emancipation role of Washington's free people of color, irrespective of assistance from white supporters, is not as well documented historically, and thus gets only a nod today. My second purpose for the exploration of the free black communities of Washington is that as a preservationist, I always want to know more about their place on the urban landscape. Huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I, I'm always curious about their footprint in this city that was uh, considered the citadel of US slavery, um, as Frederick Douglass put it. It is this purpose that took over uh, my presentation, especially in light of the 20 minutes that I have been allotted. Um, being a trainer uh, by profession, I'm always, I always try to be cognizant of the time. So my presentation is a very preliminary look at, at the place, literally and figuratively, of Washington's free black community and the Underground Railroad movement. Simply stated, from the founding of Washington, as we've heard, when the village of Carrollsburg was deeded over to George Washington in 1788 for development, African Americans have been present both as free and as enslaved. And with the establishment of the capital came the development of codes beginning as early as 1801 designed to keep enslaved in their place and discourage those so inclined from escaping or aiding others to escape. Laws prohibiting congregation of more than two uh, free blacks, two blacks free or otherwise, 10 o'clock curfews or passes to prove identity as a free person of color all serve to repress and keep in place. Uh, John, you should like this map, um, which was revised in uh, 1947. But anyway, here is Carrollsburg, the village that existed when George Washington cast his eyes over the place. And the other village is Hamburg. And of course, you see Georgetown over here. Um, not Lee Young, this is his plantation. Uh, Daniel Carroll was another uh, large landholder. And then Jenkins Hill, this was the flat plateau that Felicia referred to, uh, where they decided to build the capital. 
Uh, as a preservationist, some of the other areas uh, interest me. I've been working with the uh, Columbia Heights community, and if you're familiar with that, uh, this is uh, the Whole Mead Plantation. You know, there's Whole Mead Road, and uh, Whole Mead developed uh, that area. Um, so anyway, this is, uh, like I said, I like this map. And this is, we're talking today about Washington City as opposed to Washington as Alexandria and Georgetown. The number of free people of color as compared to the number of enslaved began to increase almost from the birth of Washington, the capital, so that by 1860, three out of every four persons of color in Washington were free. In spite of the repression imposed by the black codes and the ever-present worry for some of being kidnapped and sold into slavery, as uh, Mr. Gibbs pointed out, people of color in Washington, enslaved and free, enjoyed a modicum of freedom. In Washington, an urban area with a growing black population, it became more difficult for local authorities to monitor closely the movements of incoming or outgoing runaways. It was made even more difficult because of the residential patterns of black people. Some lived in alleys behind their master's houses, in rundown sections along the river and canals with working class whites, near uh, white residential areas where they worked as cooks, house servants, or even owned businesses, or near white owned businesses where they worked as laborers, laundresses, and porters. Slaves, hired slaves, free persons of color, white artists and mechanics, white merchants, and members of the white upper classes lived in close proximity. As an example of this, uh, in 1887, the wife of Senator Clement C. Clay wrote in her journal, quote, a favorite drive in those days was throughout the length of Pennsylvania Avenue, then but sparsely and irregularly built up. The greatest contrasts in architecture existed. Hovels often all but touching the mansions of the rich, end quote. This race and class mixing sometimes provided runaways opportunities to mix in and remain unnoticed, which was both a blessing and curse for people of the darker hue. Indeed, for one Isaac Williams, it was a blessing. He ran away in 1854 from slavery in Southern Virginia and traveled by foot all the way to Canada. In his account, he talked of being harassed at nearly every turn in uh, Virginia and in Maryland, and had many narrow escapes. But in between, he crossed the Long Bridge into the district, into uh, the district from Virginia. When he did so, he was able to, quote, pass through Washington City, end quote, while smoking cigars and swinging a cane. He was indeed indistinguishable from other black men of Washington and was able to pass for free. While blacks lived all over Washington and in parts of Washington County, free people of color were concentrated in certain areas of the city. From these communities where they lived and established churches and schools and businesses, they assisted others to become free. I'm using uh, Keith Melder's map that's in the City of Magnificent Intentions because, uh, you know, I couldn't do it better. He adapted this from Letitia Woods Brown. Um, in her residential patterns uh, of uh, free people in Washington. Um, through the establishment of institutions, free people of color ensured that people had the spiritual support, the education, the financial means, the shelter, and the network to be free. They even conveyed unknowingly the appropriate comportment or way of being to be free, uh, as we witness with our cane swinging friend, uh, Isaac Williams. Historians, preservationists have concluded, though, that few buildings of significance to the Underground Railroad in Washington exist, and the dearth of heritage trails, tours, and literature reflect this opinion. I advocate, however, for recognition of the sites and for elevating, in general, the local abolitionist and emancipation activism to the level that is enjoyed by places, uh, say, like Cincinnati, Ohio, or New Bedford, Mass. Our story is just as important. There was as much activity uh, happening here. So as you can see from this slide, the dark uh, squares represent uh, free black communities. 
and uh, here's Massachusetts Avenue, North Carolina, the capital, Pennsylvania. So you can see that this is, uh, by 1860, this is where free people of color lived. They lived uh, around the Navy Yard, and actually this corridor, uh, the 8th Street corridor is considered uh, Navy Yard. They lived in Southwest, um, and then in Northwest from, um, from this area down sort of I and K streets uh, from what I call uh, Lower Shaw to the uh, Rock Creek. These letters uh, connote businesses that were owned, in, and I will get to that in a minute. And then these are the wards uh, that existed at that time. Um, there were free people of color in Georgetown and in other parts of uh, Washington County, but I'm limiting in this presentation to old Washington City. So be, again, because of the time, I'm, I only selected a few people to talk about in a few places. Uh, but these are places that I think are important to the emancipation movement in Washington and could, could perhaps be a starting point for formal recognition through markers, trails, or other designation. So, at the Navy Yard, and again, uh, I don't know what eminent historian you're talking about, CR, but uh, <laughs> I'm only going to mention a few people in the Navy Yard. Uh, there were three men in particular that I thought were noteworthy, and they've been mentioned by other scholars before, who started what is considered the first uh, school for people of color in, in Washington. Their names were George Beale, Nicholas Franklin, and Moses Liverpool. The year was 1807. In setting up the school, they had to make assurances that the teacher would do no writing for slaves. This site was thought to be at 4th and L Southeast. Uh, Liverpool and Franklin worked as caulkers in the Navy Yard, which was the same profession that Frederick Douglass had before he escaped from uh, slavery. Both men, Liverpool and Franklin, owned property. Liverpool purchased his property in 1806 from a white merchant, William Prout, I mentioned earlier, who owned much of the land that is considered Capitol Hill in the Navy Yard. Liverpool lived on the west corner of 4th and K Southeast in a household of seven, most likely his wife and five children. Prout, whose home stood at 8th and M, is the subject of a trail marker for Barracks Row. Um, Nicholas Franklin lived on the southeast corner. These two men lived across the street from each other at 4th and K, and most likely with his wife and at least two children. Their residences are long gone and actually are the site of Carrollsburg Public Housing uh, in, in southeast, which of course is now being torn down for a whole six project. Um, this is not exactly at that corner, but it was the closest photo I could get. This is a part of the Carrollsburg. Um, these three clearly had the means and proximity to offer shelter information and connections. Capitol Hill, uh, the third person, George Beale, lived on Capitol Hill on the west side of 6th Street, southeast between D and E. And again, this is not his house. This is clearly an 1890s house, but I'm giving you an idea of the proximity of, of his uh, place of residence. Again, many of these places are gone and have been built over, but I find it exciting to go to the spot and imagine what used to be there. Um, in 1838, William Proud and his wife Rachel sold property for the construction of Little Ebenezer Church at 4th and D Southeast. Ebenezer, as you know, has a rich history of involvement in the liberation movement. 
The house is on the African American Heritage Trail and was commemorated recently with a marker. Are you all familiar with this building? But it's right on Capitol Hill. Now this is not the original church, obviously, but they have worshiped on that spot since at least the 1840s. Uh, the first pastor of this church was black. Uh, not the first pastor, but its first black pastor who came uh, somewhat later, the first pastors for many of the black churches uh, were white, was a man named Noah Jones, who himself was a landowner as of 1824 in southeast Washington at 10th between F and E, where the L'Enfant Promenade is located, and of course was in close proximity to the wharves. Uh, just to show you an overview, so this is about the place of George Beale's house. Remember, he helped start the first school and some other things. And uh, this is where the church is that you just saw. And there actually were slave quarters uh, in here on, on South Carolina. Um, of course, it wasn't nearly as filled in, but just to give you an idea of where uh, at least one of the prominent men of, of capital, one prominent black men of Capitol Hill lived in proximity to a uh, active church. William Coston, who worked as a porter for the Bank of Washington and who was reputed to be related to Martha Washington, lived on A Street uh, fronting the Capitol Square as did a number of free and enslaved blacks. Costin uh, challenged one of the black codes uh, requiring black residents to post a bond to ensure good behavior. The court allowed the code to stand, but ruled that blacks who resided in Washington before the enactment would be exempted. He was the president of a school established by the Committee of Resolute Beneficial Society and the vice president of the Columbian Harmony Society, two organizations that provided assistance to runaways. His daughter started his daughters started and maintained a school from Mr. Costin's home for 15 years. Again, they're right across from the Capitol. Franklin Beale Liverpool, along with Costin and John F. Cook, whom you'll hear about later, started a church at 4th between Virginia and G Street Southeast, the Israel Bethel AME Church, which is linked to today's Metropolitan AME at 15th and M and Israel CME at Fifth and Randolph. Founded in 1830, Israel had a black pastor uh, from the very beginning. A subsequent pastor, William Nichols, was involved with white abolitionist uh, Charles Torrey in the planning and execution of the Pearl Escapes. When it failed, Nichols literally scared himself to death. Uh, it's been remarked by a number of accounts that he was so frightened that he made himself sick and died. A fugitive who might have received assistance from a Capitol Hill network was Adam Smith, who fled his owner, Isaac Skaggs of Beltsville, Maryland, on a Saturday night, leaving behind a wife and child. Slaveholder Skaggs and his wife, who, according to Smith, hated a colored man to have any comfort in the world, had eight adult and nine young slaves. Smith's mother lived on Capitol Hill at the home of a Mr. Hamilton. With the help he received, Smith made it to William Still's office in Philadelphia, came back two weeks later, we're talking about 150 miles, came back two weeks later and uh, took his wife and children and then went on to Canada. The Library of Congress, the Folger Library, congressional buildings, and 395 have taken the place of these early communities. Uh, Southwest, we've talked about Noah Jones, Anthony Bowen, who many of you have heard of, lived at E Street Southwest between 9th and 10th after he was manumitted in 1830. He founded St. Paul AME Church in 1856 in his home, and this was after he broke away from uh, Union Zion Wesley, which he helped to found in 1833. You see, these were very active people of color. He was one of the best known conductors on the Underground Railroad and is mentioned on a Southwest Heritage Trail marker. So there are a few, not many. 
A runaway who might have received assistance in Southwest was Nace Shaw, who worked as a foreman in the Upper Marlboro area for, in his words, a more disagreeable family of old maids that could not be found in a year's time. Leaving behind his wife and grown son, he said he left simply because he wanted to die a free man if it pleased God to have it so. Shaw's mother, whose name we don't know, lived in Washington on South B Street, Independence Avenue. In the Northwest, uh, which is where the overwhelming majority of uh, blacks lived, we go back to this map, and where the best documented Underground Railroad activity occurred, uh, again, along here, and I am uh, just going to focus on, on a few. We have uh, schools uh, founded by free people of color, the Wormley School at Vermont, let me see if I can, if I can see it, at Vermont and I Street, uh, right here. The um, Smothers School that later became the Columbian Institute and Union Seminary. Right here. The uh, members of the, uh, oh, the Columbian uh, Institute, which then was changed to the Union Cemetery, then was moved by George Cook uh, to the well-known 15th Street uh, Presbyterian Church. Members of the early Wormley family lived in several locations, including I Street between 15th and 16th, and 8th between G and H. William was a hack driver, and I don't know if you all know what a hack driver is, but that was the modern day cab. They were in very good positions to see what was going on, transport people, and so on. Uh, and William, I think, is the father of then the later Wormley who established the hotel, George Wormley. Uh, Leonard Grimes, a well-documented conductor in the Underground Railroad, was also a hackman. He lived at 22nd and H Street. He was finally caught after a Loudoun County incident in which he assisted a woman and her six children to escape. Grimes beat the case, but left nonetheless. I guess so. Uh, while still jailed, he executed a deed of trust to his uncle, William Bush, to care for his family uh, his wife, children, and for his property. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Where it says Potomac and River. Mm -hmm. At the end of Maryland Avenue. Is that the Long Bridge? The, uh, no, the Long Bridge is, uh, let me see, Maryland Avenue. Yeah, this is the old, uh, this is the 14th Street Bridge. And uh, yeah, they no longer. I don't know if they even use Maryland Avenue down here. You know, this, they do. Okay. Yeah. So that's the Long Bridge. That was the Key Bridge. I mean, the uh, bridge going across into uh, Georgetown. Okay. So this is at uh, 15th and K today, the block where the Wormleys lived, uh, where his. Uh, the Cooks lived close by. Uh, Francis Datcher, a messenger with the War Department, also lived on I Street in this area. Datcher helped, uh, he was a messenger with the War Department, which again was a very key uh, profession to have and one of the higher uh, professions of a free person of color. Uh, he helped found the 15th Street Presbyterian Church, again, a hotbed of black abolitionism. John F. Cook lived at the corner of 17th and H. Born a slave, he was purchased into freedom by his aunt, Alethea Turner, who worked and bought the freedom of several other family members. Cook was an ardent abolitionist and was considered Washington's most prominent race man at the time. He founded or helped found several institutions that became deeply involved in the emancipation of slaves including here locally at the 15th Street Presbyterian Church and Union Seminary. His sons continued his legacy. 
The second colored Baptist, established in 1848 in a home at 6th and K, moved to 3rd and H in 1856, where it remains today on this site. Do you all know this building? And do you know what's happening around this building today? What was that? Oh, uh, I can't hear you, but high-rise condos are going up and behind and on the side. That's at uh, 3rd and H. Now, where, yeah, Northwest. We're talking about Northwest now. Now, while this is not the original building, these, this congregation has worshipped on this site since 1856. I would say it's hallowed ground, but unfortunately, they did not purchase the property or whatever, uh, as so many of our institutions, and so they're a casualty uh, in the sense that the landscape will be gone. Uh, this, was, this church was founded by William Bush, among um, others, who was the uncle of Leonard Grimes. Uh, many blacks in another area of the Northwest live near the Glass House, a glass factory that was located at the foot of 20th Street in the old Hamburg Village. Remember, I showed you that. And what is now the Tidal Basin. Close proximity to water routes, railroads, major roads always drew runaways and were generally places where those who wanted to assist, as well as those who wanted to catch, were on the lookout. Also in Foggy Bottom, there is a house at 25th and I Street that is said to have underground railroad connections. And actually, it's, it's this. It was a one-story uh, frame building, one of the few in Foggy Bottom. At Fifth and I, there is an existing uh, antebellum house that was owned by a free black family headed by Charles Thomas. Although it has been considerably altered from the frame house that lies beneath the updated facade, uh, there is a story yet uh, to be uncovered. And that's this uh, house. When you go around to the back, you can see the original, or close to the original frame uh, structure. Uh, we tried to get this in the Mount Vernon Triangle Historic District, um, but it's kind of removed from other buildings, so it will go away soon. Finally, there were free black communities, as I said earlier, in Georgetown and other places in Washington County, such as Tenley Town, Palisades, Brookland, Anacostia. Patricia Woods Brown identified at least four extant Georgetown houses which uh, you probably should know about these. Uh, one of which was owned by John or James 